Hello, so in today's video I'm going to show you how you can analyze 19th century texts effectively. So this is for you if you are studying any of these texts or you're going to study Jekyll and Hyde, a Christmas Carol, or any of the other books that are listed here. It is also for you if you're doing English language because there's a very high chance that in at least one of the papers you will have a 19th century text and so the methods and techniques that I'm going to show you today will be very relevant for you as well. You're going to learn in this video five things. Writers' messages, what they are and how to interpret them. Context, what that is. How to use it in your paragraphs. The context of the 19th century and application, so how to actually apply this in an example. Just one thing to clear up before we get into it, the 19th century is the 1800s, if you didn't know that already, because the year zero is not the zero century, it's the first century. So we're in the 21st century because it's 20, 22, not 21, 22. So the 1800s is the 19th century, they call it in the exam the 19th century novel. So the first thing we have to understand is a writer's message. A writer's message is an opinion about a theme which the writer wants to communicate to the reader using their text. A theme is just a big topic that a writer could have an opinion about. So poverty could be a theme. Science, religion, prejudice, social class, gender, which is relations between men and women. These are all themes, and writers have opinions about them. So, for example, Charles Dickens in A Christmas Carol, which some of you have heard of, and even if you've not, you might have heard of Scrooge, who is the famous, greedy, miserable, selfish old man in A Christmas Carol, who hates Christmas and hates everyone else, and then has his mind changed by four ghosts who visit him during the night. Well, Dickens in that book wrote the book because many people at the time didn't believe in helping the poor. So his message about poverty was a society should do more to help the poor instead of sending them to the workhouse, which was a place a bit like a prison where you had to go if you didn't have enough money to look after yourself, otherwise you had to just starve to death. And Scrooge in the book says, well, they should go to the workhouse if they're poor, or if they starve, then that's actually a good thing because it will reduce the population. And the point is that many people at the time believed that, and Dickens wrote the book to show why they were wrong. So that's his message. Or possible interpretation, and it's up to you if you agree with all of these, right? Because there's no right or wrong answer here, everyone. It's just what you think the writer's trying to say. So one interpretation of Jekyll and Hyde, um, which some of you have studied, so this is where Jekyll uses science to split his personality in two, so the evil half is Mr. Hyde, and then Mr. Hyde eventually takes over, and then Jekyll ends up dying because Hyde murders somebody and then kills himself before the police get to him, and so Jekyll dies as well. So it's a pretty uh, sad ending. But one interpretation of all of this is that it's actually against religion, because the reason that Jekyll split his personality in the first place was because the things that he enjoys, and it's not actually clear what those things are, but things that society didn't approve of, or religion especially, did not approve of, he wanted to do with a different personality, to be Mr. Hyde, so he could go and have fun and do stuff that he wasn't meant to do as a Victorian gentleman in a religious society. So one interpretation is that the book was written to criticise religion, and to criticise the Christian values of Victorian England, and Stevenson had this message that religious values can actually make you deny your true self. That's one viewpoint. Or, a different viewpoint, though you could actually say that both are true, is that he's also criticising science. Because Stevenson uh, shows us how science can be dangerous, because Jekyll uses science, and then he loses control. And he ends up dying, because the experiment he did has such a massive consequence that he couldn't have foreseen, so science ends up being very dangerous. So these are just some examples of opinions writers have about themes. Now, context is just, it's actually two things. So, first of all, historical context is events and beliefs at the time. And then literary context is links between different parts of the same text. So you're linking together different chapters or staves or, or acts or scenes or whatever. You're showing that the bit you're analysing is actually just part of a bigger book, and you're not just analysing one quote on its own. So... Here are two examples of using context, okay? And I want you to look at it and decide, in fact, comment underneath right in a moment, which one you think is best. 
Okay, if you're finding this video helpful so far, please like the video and hit the subscribe button because I have lots of videos on different areas of English. So here's the first um, use of context. Dickens shows that poverty is not always the individual's fault. At the time, the poor were treated badly because the 1834 New Poor Law said that anyone unable to look after themselves had to go to a workhouse where families were separated and conditions were very poor. That's number one. Here's number two. Dickens shows that poverty is not always the individual's fault, through highlighting how Scrooge cannot seriously believe in the Malthusian theory which said that it is good for the poor to starve, even if it reduces the population, since he does not believe in this theory after meeting the ghosts. Okay, so which one is better? Put in the comments, give you 10 seconds, put in the comments under the video one or two, which one is better? Pause the video while you do that. Okay, so which one did you think? If you said number two, you are right. Now, the interesting thing here is that number one in some ways has more detail. So it actually mentions a date and a particular law and it explains what that law was. But number one does not relate to that detail to the text. It says something about Dickens and then it just dumps some information about history. Number two actually links the history to the book. So number two actually says how Dickens's message about poverty and about why the Malthusian theory is wrong, how that message is explained and how it is influenced by the times that he lived in and the attitudes of people at the time. So Dickens was trying to prove wrong a popular theory at his time. So number two is much better, much more linked in to the actual point of English, which is to explain the writer's message. Number one is history. You don't get any marks for knowing the history. You can know all the facts about the context, but unless you can relate them to the book, you won't get many marks for AO3, which is context. Okay, so how do we use context? Well, a couple of ways. One is like I just showed you in number two, to help you better understand what the writer is trying to say about a topic. Because if you know about the topic, it's easier to understand their message, right? Just like a writer now writing about a pandemic, well, if you didn't know that COVID-19 happened, then you wouldn't really understand everything they said very clearly. Imagine if you were a historian 100 years from now, and you were studying someone writing about pandemics, but you didn't know about COVID-19, then you'd be quite confused, and your explanation wouldn't be very good. Well, it's the same thing for us studying these Victorian texts, because if you didn't know about the poor law or how the poor were treated badly in Charles Dickens's time, then you wouldn't really be able to explain what he's trying to say in A Christmas Carol in a very clear way. Now, the other way you can use it is to compare how readers or audiences would feel. So you can compare a modern audience now and a contemporary audience at the time the book was written and see how their reactions would be different. So maybe people in Stevenson's time would feel that Jekyll was bad for creating this different personality to express his true desires because he was being immoral and going against religion. And people now might sympathise with him more and feel that it wasn't so much his fault, it was society's fault. That's an example of how reactions might be different. So you can use this formula. You can just say a contemporary reader would feel, then you put in their emotion, about the topic because, and then you give a reason, so you fill in these, these gaps where the three dots, the ellipsis is, whereas, or while, a reader today would, and then you do the same thing again. Now, inside a paragraph, we're going to actually use context to especially help us with the reader and the explanation part. So the method I recommend is point, that's your main belief, evidence, that's your quote, technique, that's the method the writer used, Explanation is you link the technique and the evidence back to the point, and then reader is the impact on the reader. So you're using the, the context in the reader part here, and when you're doing this, understanding the writer's message, which is what we did here, then you're doing that in the explanation part. So finally, we need to know a bit about the actual context of the 19th century. Now, I put in here a lot of detail. You don't need to know all of the dates and statistics. You need to get a general sense of what was going on. The general idea is more important than the specific details. So in the 1800s, we have the Industrial Revolution. So what is that? Well, you may have heard of it from history. Industrial means to do with industry, like factories. Revolution means something is changing. So what was happening at the time was that people, for the first time in history, the majority of people were working in factories and living in cities instead of being farmers. 
And in some ways, that was a very good thing, because some people got very rich. But it was mainly the factory owners who got rich, and the workers lived in very poor conditions. And when they moved into these new cities, they were dirty, they were overcrowded, there was disease. Also, if you made stuff by hand, and then they opened a factory next door, then you were going to lose your job. A bit like today, if you run a shop and then... Amazon, everyone starts buying things on Amazon, then you might lose your business, right? Same problem. So that meant many people were unemployed, they were poor, there was a great deal of poverty. And the rich had a very harsh attitude towards the poor. I mentioned this already, but they said that if you need help, you have to go to the workhouse. Not like today, where you can get benefits from the government if you don't have a job. The only way to do that was to go to a workhouse, which was basically a prison. Otherwise, you'd starve. And Part of the reason was the poor didn't have many rights. So you probably heard of how women didn't have the right to vote in the 1800s. But men also, if they were poor, didn't have the right to vote. It was only rich men who could vote until the end of the 1800s. So by 1886, you don't need to know the exact dates, but at the start of the 1800s, only rich men could vote. And that's one of the reasons they were treated badly. And there was a big class divide. So you see that, for example, in Jekyll and Hyde as well. How when Mr. Utterson goes into the poor neighbourhoods like Soho and he's kind of disgusted and horrified and how Jekyll's meant to behave very differently because he's rich and meant to be more respectable. He had a strong sense of class divide. Another important thing to understand is the idea of imperialism, which is linked into prejudice and part of prejudice is racism because in the 1800s, Britain was taking over most, uh, well, uh, a very large part of the world. So 25% of the whole world was ruled by Britain and other parts of the world were ruled by other European countries and they thought that Europeans and white people were superior and had to go and make the other countries more civilised and better. So this affected people's attitudes in literature as well and that's why, for example, in Frankenstein there's this idea that the monster, the way he's treated is almost a kind of racism. People judge him by his appearance. And even though he's actually kind, at least at first, everyone is disgusted by him and thinks he's a monster just because he looks different. So that's the same kind of thing, actually, as racism and prejudice. Um, and then one more thing to know. Uh, in fact, two, two more things. So women, we've mentioned women's rights already, but basically women had very few rights until the end of the 1800s. And then there was a campaign to give equal rights to women. You might have heard of the suffragettes, for example, who wanted women to have the right to vote. Finally, scientific ideas. So Charles Darwin, you might have heard of him, or the theory of evolution, he said that humans did not just get created by God exactly as we are now, but were actually evolved from other animals and monkeys and apes. And this was quite shocking to many religious people, which was most people at the time. And so this also affects literature because people felt there was a kind of war almost between science and religion, that the two were in conflict. So in Jekyll and Hyde, for example, it is maybe criticising science, like I said earlier. There's also references to evolution. So Stevenson describes Hyde as being ape-like, like he's the missing link between apes and humans, which would have been really shocking for the reader and kind of disturbing, reminding them of this new theory that we actually came from apes. So you can see how understanding the context, that evolution was a new idea, that it was controversial, would help you to better understand the impact of the book. Okay, so one more thing I said we'd do is application. I'm just going to show you briefly an example. So what I put down here is an example text from part of A Christmas Carol. Now, in this part of the text, Scrooge is meeting the first ghost, which is the ghost of his business partner, partner, Jacob Marley. So we're going to look at this together, and I'm just going to show you how we can use our understanding of themes, messages, and context to analyse this effectively. Scrooge had often heard it said that Marley had no bowels, but he had never believed it until now. No, nor did he believe it even now. Though he looked the phantom through and through and saw it standing before him, though he felt the chilling influence of its death-cold eyes and marked the very texture of the folded kerchief bound its head about its head and chin, which wrapper he had not observed before, he was still incredulous and fought against his senses. Okay, So he's fighting against his senses. He doesn't believe what he's seeing. How now, said Scrooge, caustic and cold as ever. What do you want with me? Much. Marley's voice, no doubt about it. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Who were you then? said Scrooge, raising his voice. You're particular, 
for a shade. He was going to say to a shade, which would mean exactly, but substituted this as more appropriate. So this is a joke because it's a pun. Um, so to a shade means exactly, but a shade is another word for a ghost. In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Can you, can you sit down? Asked Scrooge, looking doubtfully at him. I can. Do it then. Scrooge asked the question because he didn't know whether a ghost so transparent might find himself in a condition to take a chair, and felt that in the event of its being impossible, it might involve the necessity of an embarrassing explanation. But the ghost sat down on the opposite side of the fireplace as if he were quite used to it. You don't believe in me, observed the ghost. I don't, said Scrooge. What evidence would you have of my reality beyond that of your senses? I don't know, said Scrooge. Why do you doubt your senses? Because, said Scrooge, a little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheats. You may be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of an underdone potato. There's more of gravy than of grave about you, whatever you are. Scrooge was not much in the habit of cracking jokes, nor did he feel in his heart by any means waggish then. The truth is that he tried to be smart as a means of distracting his own attention and keeping down his terror, for the spectre's voice disturbed the very marrow in his bones. Okay, so, in this passage, you may have noticed a few things. Now, Scrooge is very sceptical. He doesn't believe in the ghost, and he sees it, but he doesn't believe it. And he gives an explanation. He says it could be his own digestive system. He says that, well, maybe I'm just ill. Maybe I have got food poisoning, because it could be a bit of undigested beef or something else. And he's joking about it, because he's very nervous and trying to hide how scared he is. Now, that's very interesting. Because in the book, okay, and I'm going to show you how we can take this little thing, this small thing, and actually relate it to a bigger idea, to analyse it really effectively. In the book, it's not the only time that Scrooge um, presents himself as being scientific and rational. So Scrooge also says uh, that he talks about, I mentioned it earlier, the Malthusian theory, which said that it's a good thing if some of the poor starve to death, because then there'll be less poor people and more food to go around, right, for the survivors. Now, Scrooge talks about this theory, and this was meant to be a scientific theory, right? The science of economics. It was supposed to be a scientific proof about how the world worked. So Scrooge definitely views himself as a scientific and a rational person. And you could argue that he's also quite against religion, because he's against Christmas, which is Christ Mass, so it's a religious festival. And especially in Victorian times then it was very much a religious celebration. So it might be that Scrooge is critical of religion and supports a scientific way of looking at the world. Now, if that is the case, what does that tell us about Dickens's opinion? Because remember that in that book, he wrote it to show how people who had Scrooge's beliefs were wrong. And Scrooge is a horrible person, so that when Scrooge says something, you feel that it's wrong. The whole point of Scrooge is to persuade you that the opposite is true. So when he says the poor should starve, it's kind of showing you that this is horrible and you shouldn't be like Scrooge, so you shouldn't believe that. Now, why did Dickens then make him this sceptical, scientific kind of personality? Well, here's one possible answer, and you might agree with it or you might not. But one analysis would be that, well, Dickens is trying to say that actually Christianity and religion are kinder to the poor and more compassionate than science, and they don't have this this scientific theory that we should let people starve for the economy and they would actually also accept when they when they see a ghost or a spirit because it could be a message from God and that's better more trusting and more likely to be influenced in a good way and maybe this idea of charity in Christianity in fact the charity collectors who speak to Scrooge and ask for money which is when he mentions the Malthusian theory they try to use Christianity and say that a Christian would give money well maybe that's Dickens's view that we should support Christian values instead of scientific values because they might be kinder to the poor. Up to you what you think Dickens is trying to say. The point I'm trying to make here is that you can take small things that don't seem that important, like this bit about beef and potato, and you can actually link it into a bigger idea if you understand the writer's message and you understand what was going on at the time so you can properly interpret the writer's point and what the writer's trying to say. So if you found this useful, please hit the subscribe button because I've got more videos on other texts and other areas of English language and literature, and I look forward to seeing you uh, very soon.